Hello, everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show. We got an exciting show today. I'm actually going to switch things up and not do a big long intro here because our guest has a hard stop in 30 minutes. So let's milk him for all he's worth. Uh, you guys may have seen him on Power Trading Radio. You may have taken classes with him at Online Trading Academy. You may have seen him in other ventures as he's doing stuff all throughout the industry, as a lot of the OTA instructors have done. Of course, today we're going to be reading price action with none other than Ryan Watkins. Ryan, I'm, I'm glad to have you back with us, man. How you been? Thanks, Merlin. I've been great. How about yourself? Any better, I'd be twins, which would frighten a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got some new news. I know everybody's all, and I saw a nice comment here in the chat. Jeff says, so many uh, uh, OTA instructors all got their own things going on, love it. And yeah, you know, everybody's got to go and, and do what they've got to do, which is great. Um, so Ryan has a, a new announcement, right? Yeah, yeah. I uh, am one of those instructors that went off and did my own thing. I was OTA instructor for... Oh gosh, I think 12 years or so, if I remember <laughs> by far back, so somewhere around that range, over a decade, I know for sure. And uh, I, some really good memories, met incredible people such as yourself, and a lot of friendships developed and all that type of stuff. And it just got to the point where it's like, you know, I've been wanting to branch out on my own for a while. And uh, this whole COVID thing and all that stuff, it's just like, all right, now's the time. Let's just go for it and do it. And so I started my own business, tradertactics.com. And uh, had a lot of fun with it, uh, getting real creative with it and stuff. But one thing I realized was that, boy, I, I haven't ran a business in a very long time. <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> it's not just an easy thing to do, you know. And uh, and I wanted to, you know, build it up big and have a big business and not just like one guy, you know, doing some stuff online on a website and that's all it was. You know, I really wanted to have you know, content, lots of content for all asset classes, my own proprietary strategies that I have done for many, many years, uh, you know, live trading, mentoring, the whole works, everything, A to Z, you know? And I realized like, man, this is gonna take like two years for me to get this yeah. thing really, yeah. uh, the war I wanted to get some traction on this, just just doing it myself. And, uh, and as this process is going on, I'm talking to a good friend of mine, Sam Evans, who's also, uh, a former OTA uh, instructor as well and we just kept talking back and forth as you know people friends do and stuff and he told me that he's working on something I said hey that's cool I'm, I'm doing working on my thing too and it got to the point where his business launched uh, just a little bit before mine did and we kept talking you know back and forth and he says hey Ryan I'd, I'd love to have you part of the team here and uh, you know Sam is a good trader a good educator and I found out he's a pretty good salesman too because he sold me on the idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it really kind of came down to a few things, but number one is I can keep trying to do this myself, which I was okay with, you know, but that's not what I wanted. I, I enjoyed the community, the camaraderie and all that type of stuff and, and that's what he had. It's not just Sam, he has a whole team of people, yep. uh, very experienced professional people uh, working on the, uh, on the company and he says, Ryan, I want you to be a part of that. And, you know, we really want to grow this thing, you know, be, be big, be the premier educator in the world. And so I talked with his other uh, business partner and some other people in the company and really felt at home there and bought into what they were trying to do. And the bottom line is they, I could tell, and I tested, I didn't tell him this till afterwards, but I'm like, Sam, I tested you. I, I asked him some very specific questions to find out really where his heart was at in this thing. You know, was it for all the money and glory and fame, or was it really to help the students, you know, become better traders and investors? And absolutely 100%, his heart's in the right place, and everyone on the team is too, by yeah. the way, as I got to know them as well. So I was just completely sold on it and says, hey, we can do more as a team than any one person can do by themselves. Let's yeah. go for it. Let's do this. Nice. And so we're really excited about that and started Congrats. doing I'm some gonna, stuff with them. Just I'll, I'll make about, a quick what, about change a to your screen to accommodate that right now. So I'll, there, there we go. I think I just hit OK. And there it is, stockability.com. I just want to make sure I had the timing right. right to throw it up underneath your name there. <laughs> there um, you go. All right. Well, congratulations on that. Um, Thanks, all the best brother. to you and all those endeavors. Let's dive into price action because I know we do have a 25-minute time limit here. And I don't want to keep you guys late because I know you got a class to do right after this. That's all right. Um, when I met you and your dad back on the trading floor back in, again, 98, yeah. 99. 1999, yeah. Is it 99? January of 99. <laughs> You, me, your dad, and Prince it was one hell of a time. Um, <laughs> you, you had your, your not a fro, what was it, the... Uh uh, don't say a mullet. mullet. A don't mullet. say you a mullet. Come on, man. You had a mullet, There's man. There's people on, watching right now. I don't need any. Come on. Um, I may have had a slight mullet. No big deal. I rocked that mullet, mullet, and I did not drive says. a 1978 Camaro. Um, yep. Tell me, because you were one of the ones that was 
always a student of the markets. You're always out there studying price action. And yeah. you did something for OTA years ago, which was reading price action. So I thought it might be oh, yeah, that's right. um, nice to go into the art of reading price action. Kind of what sure. are some of the things that you look for criteria with regards to price action? So uh, I guess first of all is when you're talking about when we were there on the trading floor, price was really the, the foundation of what I first learned and really stuck with that. And I, and I did I'll call stray into indicators, oscillators, and all that kind of stuff, and had my, my went through a phase and all that stuff, and uh, but it always came down to price action is the most important thing for me, because all those indicators and oscillators are derived from price anyway. So I just figured, hey, it's probably best just to learn price and study it and analyze it and really get to the the the, the bottom line of that. And so yeah, the course that you're talking about, it was called Trading Price. And uh, I believe still to this date, it was the most widely watched um, uh, hour to pro session that OTAs had, very successful and all that type of stuff. And it uh, really helped a lot of traders, but it was all focused on price action, no indicators or, or mm -hmm. anything of that nature. Not that you can't use them. And, you know, there are, I 100% believer in that, yes, they can work given certain criteria, no doubt about that. But this focus was on pure price action. And so it would be th things like where to buy, you know, either specific or in a general area, where to sell, sell short, in either specifically or in a general area, uh, trend, how to identify trend. And importantly, and, it, and what's difficult for a lot of people to tell is when does trend change direction? That's always a difficult one for people, especially as the market's moving live real time in the moment. When does trend change? It's kind of a tough one for our eyes to, to you know, see and our brain to understand. And that one takes a little practice and time, but it's worth it because if you can get in on your trade at the very beginning of a trend, you have all that trend duration mm -hmm. to let your profits run. You know, and I, I would explain it in the classes is that think of trend as like a marathon. And marathons go and go and go their long, long, long race, right? And that's like a trend. It can go and go and go for a very long period of time. It's not a sprint. You know, and sometimes you see a sprint type of action in a market like a big gap up or a big huge green or red candle. You know, those are sprints and those happen. You see those, but I'm talking more like trend, the, the long term movement in price. And those can just go and go and go for a very long period of time. And so what I found was that, you know, if I really learned that piece of it, which it, I did and it took a lot of time to, you know, get to the specifics of it. But what I want to do in my own trading is identify an area where I can buy at the very beginning of an uptrend or sell short at the very beginning of a downtrend. And mm -hmm. so, the, you know, that's really primarily what I'm looking for first and foremost. But if I don't see it in time or let's say I miss it, like I didn't, oh, I missed the, the beginning of the trend. Okay, you know, the trend is still up. So where can I get back in on that trend, you know, before that next big uh, move happens to the upside, the next big sprint, in other words. So I want to buy just before or just as that next sprint to the upside is happening. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that just comes with studying price action. We could, you know, whenever you're ready, we could look at charts and yeah, bring it up. some examples or, or it, whatever. So you know, uh, let's think... take a look at like um, uh, TXN, I believe it is. Who, so te TXN? Texas. Who the TXN, hell man? even looks at Texas Instruments anymore? Come on, I don't man. Know. Some, some old guy, you know, with the beard. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Uh, all right. Well, I mean, you're talking a beautiful, beautiful uptrend here. And, I, and really, I mean, let's be honest, everything since March, unless you're an airline stock or a cruise ship, has had a phenomenal <laughs> yeah. run over right, the past right. eight months. So that goes without saying, but uh, the chart here, I don't know what time frame you want it on, but uh, I've got a daily. the weekly first. Okay. And right. so from, you know, roughly April uh, to current time now, you know, yeah, you got a, a beautiful looking uptrend right there. And now, and here's the other thing too that I've learned about price action is there's all different shapes and sizes of uptrends, right? Yeah. So you got the, what I just call a mild uptrend. So that'd be like a, you know, 10 to 25 degree angle uptrend. Then you have a really, you know, strong solid uptrend, which is your 30 to 50 degree angle or, or you know, give or take. And then you got your real strong uptrend, which is your 70, 80 uh, degree angle uptrend. And so this one's a really nice, good-looking, strong, robust uptrend right here. And so that's really the first part is, hey, look, that's bullish. It's, it's going up, you know, and we don't want to buck the trend. Right. And so now the next question is, okay, well, how do we get in on this? Because clearly we've missed the beginning of the trend. That's long gone now. Now what? What do we get in? 
Yeah. You know, and so that's the next part of the equation here is, well, we don't want to just buy the high right there, you know, anywhere near that. We want to get in at a, a good enough price where not only do we have enough profit potential to the upside when we buy, but also that probability is stacked on our side. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm sure you've heard this a lot too, is uh, people will ask, you know, various traders or, the, you know, just they'll talk to me, what's your win percentage? Yep. I hear that all the time, yep. you know, and I'm sure you do too. What's your win percentage? It, there's so much more to it in, than the equation. You know, you could have an 80% win percentage, and some of my trades do, like credit spreads, stuff like that. They're in the right around right the 80% range, but they're not some humongous, like, home run type of trade. Right. That They're not made for that. That's not the the purpose of that type of trade. But other trades might have 30 or 40% win rate, but my goodness, they're, you know, big home run hits, you right. know. And so it really just depends on what the trader is, is trying to get out of the situation. But um, that being said, there is a, a I think, a, a sweet spot or good balance between let's get a decent and good healthy amount of probability of profit along with a pretty good profit potential, whatever right. that may mean. Someone can define that in their own trading. But in order to do that, we need to wait for price to come back down a little bit, pull back. And so if you flip to, say, a daily chart. Yep. Right around the 145 area, what, let's call it 140, 145 area to 150, you know, 140 to 150, let's just call it that, okay, 140 okay. to 150, that area. So that area is where I would be looking to buy. Now, to let's say to get into a long position, that doesn't necessarily mean buy the stock at, say, $150. That just could mean, hey, look, I'm bullish, now I want to use one of my investment vehicles or trading vehicles to get into that. So that could be buying the actual underlying, the, the TXN, the stock mm -hmm. itself. That could be buying uh, options on it or you know selling credit spreads, whatever it may be. But a bullish position in that area right there. So there's lots of different ways that we can do this. If that was futures, fine, then we're doing futures contracts or options on futures or Forex, and then it's Forex, lot, you know, different lot sizes. But the bottom line is we want to engage in that trend right in that sweet spot, that area called the area of interest or some people call it buy zone, call it whatever you want. Whatever you want that's yeah. the area that I am bullish in. Um, you know, when looking at this one, you know, one of the things you said earlier was, you know, obviously the goal is to get on a nice winner, a runner, you know, that trade that just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and, and you're making a nice profit on it. And they're always inevitably guaranteed 100 percent guaranteed will come a point when it just stops moving up and starts to head to the south side now on the same chart that you had up earlier on texas instruments i'm going to zoom out here to the weekly guys i think you all saw what i was drawing here ryan was talking about different slopes and you look at the slope of the line from 2012 to 2015 you know that's a good what a 30 percent slope then you look from 2016 to 2018 and you're looking at like 65% slope. And now, I mean, this most recent one from the March lows is at like 75, maybe 80% slope, depending on the angle that we're, you know, condensing the chart sure. down. And I, I could make it 45 if I wanted to. <laughs> but, you know, I guess my question here is when you have this series of progressively more intense rallies, a bull market phases for something, does that set it up for more of a, an aggressive sell off when something has that kind of too far too fast perspective and in this most recent one you're looking at 34 weeks it's up 76 yeah. percent um you know that's buying good, in that 140 to 150 zone seems seems logical but you got to be pretty quick to put the brakes on it and be bail, ready to bail when this thing goes south so it's a great comment i'm glad you you stated that and asked that question too is that and i've gone through that myself is how far is too far right yeah and what i found is when you have these good, solid, robust uptrends like this, those just go and go and go, and they can just keep going for such a long period of time. And if I am subjective about this, then that will get me in a lot of trouble. Like, for example, say, oh, it's too high, it can't go any higher, it can't go any higher, <laughs> and six months later, it's like 100 points higher, you know, and I yeah. missed out on that. Trust me, I've done that so many times, so many times, and I'm like, enough's enough, just be objective about it and say, what is happening? It is going higher, mm -hmm. and it is an uptrend, and it is getting, not now, but closer into that buy zone, and if it gets in that buy zone, then I will initiate some form of a long position, options by the you know shares, whatever it may be, and then you know have my target set in place, my trade management set in place, and what I have found, Merlin, is that being more objective or rule-based like that has produced much better results than me trying to 
you know, outguess the market or, sure. or put my opinion into the market and say, no, I'm right, the market's wrong. Trust me, that doesn't work <laughs> out so well in the long run. Maybe you win one here and there, but yeah. it doesn't work out so well. So I, I and if price was to really start moving up fast, I mean, just like a sprint, like it's really going from what's at 155 now to let's say like 180 in just a matter of a couple days or something like that. Then it's really starting to get stretched, right? Yep. Then I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, we have gone, here's the outlier, that statistical outlier. Now it's not just a subjective, hey, it's gone too far, but now it's an objective, it's gone too far. And it's you know far above what that norm is, mm -hmm. and so now it's like okay, yes, I do have trade management tactics that allow me to tighten up the stop, and I call it squeezing out that profit, that last little bit of profit out there, because the farther price moves away from that normal distribution of trend, the much higher likelihood it is it's going to snap back and come back to that yeah. you know the mean or closer to that normal uh, trend right there. So yeah, if it if it really starts to get stretched, I'm absolutely going to be either you know it's going to be hitting my targets if that's the case. But if it's not, if I'm just letting it run, then I'm just simply moving my stop up little up. by little by little. Right. And if it really starts going what I call ballistic or just straight up, and we've seen those occasionally. It's 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 called it's called Bitcoin, Ryan. It's called Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that one go straight down too, Merlin. <laughs> <laughs> that yep. one definitely goes both ways. Yep. So if, if price starts going straight up on something like that, okay, no problem. What I'll do is I will drop it down into smaller time frames and move the stop up using what's called the technical stop. So right now we're looking at the weekly, but if this thing starts going straight up, I'm dropping down to the daily or the 240 or even a 60 minute chart and using a technical stop on that. But that's only if it really starts to right. you know get uh, get moving straight up vertical real, real fast. You're basically I've just found, you know, that's an objective way for me to actually manage the trade and trade in a much more um, consistent manner. You know, in that it makes total sense for any viewers at home or any guys watching right now. It's like it, when he's talking about that thing going parabolic and getting that huge astronomical spike up, you know, that's a time where having a longer leash sometimes doesn't make sense. So ratchet it up because it, you, price usually doesn't move like that when you get that straight right. up angle. And, and, and I was kind of joking with Bitcoin, but if you guys have seen it, uh, it has moved from 11,000 to 18,000 in a period of seven days. That's a parabolic move. I mean, it's one of those things that if you were not a long-term holder here, I agree with what Ryan's saying. Oh, sorry, this is weeks, my bad. Um, it's been six weeks for it to move that fast but it could have those days um you know you want to maybe start moving your stop loss up and locking in some of those profits here if it does now good question that came in from uh batanai he says what are your strategies to tell you it's time to jump in without any indicators so when you're looking at your entries or exits i mean you you know you're not really using an indicator to help you out but you're right. just using simple price bands right right so it's just price just price patterns so it's not like, uh, say, an overbought signal or oversold from an RSI, a, a CCI, or any you know, stochastic. It's nothing yeah. like that. It can be. Again, I got nothing against it because I think yeah. for some people, that's probably a better way to go because it gives them a rule-based filter to use. Right. Nothing wrong with that part. But once you've been doing it for five, ten years, you're like, okay, I know what overbought is. I know what oversold is. I don't need to look at that indicator anymore. You, 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 your eyes get trained to that. Your brain, what we call muscle memory, gets trained to that. So you just don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so now you can just look at price and say, yep, that's doing what I want it to do. Uh, but the other thing too is that when you look at different price patterns, and there are so many different I mean, there's books written about and websites dedicated to just price patterns. I know you know some of those, and because uh, we used to teach some of those out of yep. our uh, the, the, the old curriculum, you know, all kinds of different patterns. Yeah. But what's interesting is people trade patterns for a reason because they are very frequently seen in the markets, and the results are quite consistent. And when they're not consistent with, with what you expect then you know it's going to be consistent with what you don't expect. Meaning, what I mean by that is if you see a certain bullish pattern and let's say 75% of the time it goes higher because it is a bullish pattern, you're like, okay, so that means I'm going to be buying, so it's likely to 75% going to go higher. But 25% it's not. It's going to go lower, which right. would be a stop out for us. But when it stops us out, we're like, oh, hey, that didn't work. That means get out the short gun. Here we go. I'm going to look for shorting opportunities now. So either way, you're in a good situation. Even though you took a stop on one of them, but you know the pattern had failed, so now it's 
going the opposite way. And you might even have a full trend change at that point in time. Right. So it's really specific price patterns I'm looking for. Uh, like the one I explained here in TXN is just, you know, a nice, healthy, robust uptrend where I'm looking to buy in that lower area there uh, from that swing low compared to that uh, uh, the high of that uh, breakout from that swing high area there. And it's the other, here's the other thing too that I think viewers and just anyone any trader should really focus on is focus on simplicity. Yeah. And and I know you've probably been through this. I, I've been through this. I had, I don't even know how many rules I had, Merlin. I actually have a picture somewhere where it shows me trading. I had six monitors and I had, I think, about nine or so indicators on my screen uh -huh. with a humongous level two screen with big font. You could see all the level two, you know, the, <laughs> the ECNs and the market makers and stuff. And I had all this stuff on my screen and it sure looks really cool. And you could like you know show your friends like oh this is what I do it's so fun it's cool it's better than any game those gamers don't know what they're doing you know <laughs> but I didn't know what I was doing you know it's just like it's just a bunch of busy stuff on my chart and now the charts are you know basically naked yeah you know right. they're very very few if any indicators on there and if there is an indicator on there it is very purposeful there's a very specific reason why it's on there mm -hmm. you know like for example uh, some people might use Fibonacci. And that's an indicator or some form of it. And again, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it's used in a very specific way, very purpose-driven, purpose driven, purposeful way. Then it's an excellent resource for someone to use because there's a rule base around that, but it also gives someone that consistency that every trader needs to have. And that could be a stochastic, it could be MACD, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. you know. But in the end, you could have the best indicator in the world, but if it doesn't have the right price action, it's not going to matter. Right. You know, the right location, the right direction, and, and you know, I teach in my classes. There's primarily two things that every trader needs to get really good at. That's direction and location. Those two things: the direction that price is going on whatever time frame they're using, and the right location to either buy or sell short. Um, you know, walk me through. You had a couple of things you wanted to talk about, uh, other markets you wanted to look at, and clearly tech, Texas Instruments. Even though I can't believe who, what, what the hell do they even do? Who's using calculators I don't know, man. nowadays? It's just a company, just buy it. I don't get it. It's I mean calculators, right? They're I, in Texas. That's all you need to know. They're in Texas. <laughs> Either that or they make instruments. Well, Everything's you know, bigger in Texas, more. including right. the share yeah, price, yeah. apparently. In um, including the trends. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> it's trending up. Texas Love it. It's trending. Um, what are the ones that you want to look at? Just I, I think we should probably look at a broad market, like maybe look at the NASDAQ, Russell, s Sure, let's take a look at uh, the NASDAQ, and, and that'll give us a little different picture, too. All right. Well, do uh, you want the futures, ETFs? Does it matter? Well, let's go QQQ first. We'll okay. see what that... Take a look at that. Let's start with the weekly, I suppose. All right. I'll uh, zoom out here and go to the weekly and... Um, so funny how you know this is why I encourage everybody to to play around a lot with charts because you saw the daily there and when I click one button, it looks completely different. It looks nothing like the daily when you switch it over to the weekly, but uh, we still get a lot of information from it. So what do you where do you want to start here with the weekly? So on the weekly, this first of all, this looks different than Texas Instruments. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> And, and again, that just, hey, it's different. You know, it's not bad, it's not, it's just different. So this is part of training our eyes to look for very specific things. So, for example, the Texas Instrument trade, that's kind of a no-brainer. Hey, you just buy the pullback, you got a nice healthy uptrend. That, that's a fairly straightforward one there. But this one, I would not say that is a healthy uptrend. Yeah. In fact, it's sideways. It, it is going sideways. It has been for quite some time now. And it's you know really stuck between about 260 to 300 ish right right around that range, and so on something like this, some traders get really just like they don't like sideways markets. I, I have a friend of mine, he's just like oh, I hate sideways. I never want to trade it ever. Oh. Okay, fine. I mean that's you know, everyone's Teach got their own. Things. Yeah, I know exactly right. And and I look at sideways is this is kind of straightforward. You just you know, you look to buy during those extreme lows and short near the extreme highs, and let's just leave it at that. Yeah. You take what the market gives you. You take what the market gives you. And, and Merlin, I'll tell you, that's been a lesson I've learned over the years is mm -hmm. instead of me trying to force my thoughts, my opinion, my perception on the market, like you will do this and I'm going to make you do it because I got 48 shares of the QQQ I'm buying right now. You know, mm -hmm. that doesn't work, you know. And it's more of just stepping back and say, what is the market telling me objectively? And then me saying, what is my plan, my actual trade plan for that particular market? So this one's a sideways market. 
So right now, I'm looking for shorting opportunities around the 300 area and looking for buying opportunities around the 260 area until proven wrong. wrong. Right. You know, so for example, this very well could break out to the upside. I would expect it would at some point in time. I mean, it's, if, you know, yeah, country keeps being bullish and the economy bullish and the, the markets are bullish, then, then this is going to be bullish too. It's just a matter of time. Right. Or if we go negative and things start getting worse and goes down, then it's going to break the 260. Okay, fine. Either one is an opportunity for it. So if it breaks to the upside, my plan is buy the newly formed uptrend. If it stays sideways, buy low, short, high. Keep it simple. Right. If it breaks the 260, you know, look for those shorting opportunities and, and short the newly formed downtrend. Mm -hmm. So really, it's come from me trying to overthink and overanalyze everything to being almost really a minimalist in my charting and in my my planning and thinking it, and just it's, it's just gotten more and more simple and we found that simple is best and, I agree. and even i was talking with you know sam evans and uh some of the other uh, uh partners there and co-workers at uh, at stockability and we're just like look we just want to focus on simple yeah because there's so many elaborate strategies out there it's like okay what are people actually going to learn they learn simple and easy. So let's teach that and let's implement that and let that be the actual strategies that are taught. And you know, we've got already really good success uh, success stories from that because it's simple and easier to learn. Yeah, you know, I think the big challenge is, and this is, I think, with anything in life, it's not just trading. It could be acting. I mean, uh, there's a great video. God, who's the guy that did um, American Psycho? The second, the American Psycho. Uh, what's his name? You're the lead actor in that movie. No. Oh God, he's he's a Christian Bale. He was like just so oh, into it, okay. and overacting. I think making too much of his uh -huh. work that he literally just exploded on set. It's one of these YouTube videos where you can just hear him just losing his frigging mind on set live, and it's like it's, I think the same thing in trading. Like the more that we force something, the more we f try to make it and really go over the top. That's usually when things don't work. And a lot of times when you just step back and you can make it as simple as possible, go, it can't be this easy, that's when it ends up actually working. And, and I, I agree with you. When I started yeah. off, I, and maybe that was part of my fault because you know when I were learning together back on the trading floor in yeah. the late 90s, yeah. um, you know, I had 10, 12, 15 different indicators on my screen. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. stochastics, Bollinger. I think, well, I think a lot of us did. On that. Yeah, and you <laughs> realize that like six of them are telling you the same thing, right? I got yeah, MACD, right. RSI, stochastics, CCI. All four of those are telling you pretty much the same thing. And right. finally, I'm like, let's take those off. And what am I really trading? What am I really making money on? It's price. So if we just focus on that, great. And um, what I wanted to show in this chart here, guys, is Ryan was talking about um, kind of just setting rules and saying if it stays in that yellow box, which I've mapped out here right around three, looks like just about 300 to three, 260, you know, short the highs and, and go long the lows. And, you know, he could go long at uh, 262, thinking it's going to bounce back up and be totally wrong as it breaks down and goes all the way down to 230. Ryan's not going to sit there and hold the bag as it drops to 230, right? It's saying, hey, I'll buy at 260. I've got a stop loss and maybe at 258, 259, 250, whatever the stop loss is. Get out, and now I'm looking for the short trade. So real quick, easy to admit that you're wrong. I mean, that's the beauty of having a simple strategy. You say that you're wrong, move on, and forget about that previous, obviously learn from it, but if your sure. rules are solid, you shouldn't really have to overthink what went wrong on the trade. You just know it didn't do what you thought it was gonna do, and you move on to the next one. And that's a really great point, Merlin, is that every single trader, we're gonna have times where we're wrong, you know, what we believe it's gonna do. And we have to be quick yep. to and, and decisive, but not just quick to know that we're wrong, but decisive and saying, I'm wrong, that's it, done. Cut the losses short. Cut the losses short. Why let it why bleed out yeah. your 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 financial, you know, your account right there? Why bleed it out? It just doesn't make any sense. I know psychologically we have other reasons why we do things. You know, we don't want to take losses, fear of losing money, all, all these different things come to mind. But bottom line is good treaters traders know when they're wrong and they're decisive about getting out when yeah. they are wrong. Ryan and I spent uh, many a days on that trading floor out in Irvine, California and I can yeah. tell you we both probably have uh, full weeks worth of stories of traders losing every <laughs> single penny they have doing okay. dumb stuff and you're like you just oh, shake yeah. your head and then you go okay I'm actually starting to make those mistakes too so let me just move on and, and uh, you know learn from it. Uh, it is exactly 2.30 which means I told you we'd have you out at 2.30 so Ryan I want to thank you so much for coming on. Next time I'm going to get you on for like 35 minutes though we'll get you on for more because uh, I want to go the extra deeper. five I'm good for it. No no it's cool I, I, don't, I, I know you got a class to teach your students are priority I I'm gotta not give teaching you that. it Sam's teaching it. Oh I mean, <laughs> 
He'll be fine without me. All right, and then give me one example. One more example. Let's talk about Alibaba. You brought that one sure, up. Sure, right? sure. Yeah, we can do that. We'll do one All right, more. so we'll bring up Alibaba here. This is one that uh, clearly is painting a different picture than what we've started yep. off with. We started yep. off with Super Strong with Texas Instruments. We looked at Sideways Chop with NASDAQ, and now we're looking at somebody that might be playing taps. <laughs> exactly. You need that theme music. <laughs> so this is a... a uh, yet another different picture here. So we got three really different pictures here. You know, monthly, weekly, daily, whatever. We're seeing some weakness here. We're seeing red candles. Yeah. You know, uh, if you go to the daily chart, just real briefly here, we got a nice, clear-looking downtrend on that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where it gets to. Well, what style of trading are we doing here? Most of my trading is swing trading. That means anywhere from one to five days up to maybe a few weeks. That's predominantly my my okay. uh, my area right there, you know. And uh, so something like this on the daily, I look at this, boy, we sure got quite a bit of room to the downside here. Yeah. Like I'm looking at the monthly and be like, boy, we got you know till about 200 yeah. before we start really seeing some real serious buyers come in. And so we could be looking for shorting opportunities in that downtrend. You know, writing it down to that 200, 210 ish, whatever area down there. And when it gets to that $200 area, okay, now we know we got some good support there, demand, whatever you want to call it. And we could start looking for either a, a bullish reversal for a buying opportunity. Uh, again, depending on if you want to do the stock or options or however you want to play it. But in situations like this, we really got two different ways of looking at this. We are a short term short seller. Yep. But more of a longer term buyer but we got to wait for that though right we wait for that one to get lower so really we could do this both ways or maybe a trader just says no nah, i don't want to do the short stuff maybe they got an ira and they don't want to do it. what i don't want to mess with it it's okay fine then we just got to wait till it gets down to 200 and then they could do what they want to do in a long position there mm -hmm. you know you, let me i just gotta say you're talking about shorting you said maybe they don't they can't short an ira don't you know ryan that shorting is anti-patriotic you're <laughs> betting against america or in this case, China with Alibaba. <laughs> what, that, yeah. You're betting about China. Well, maybe that's patriotic then. There, there you go. What do you, yeah, right. what do, you do about that? Be an American. Short Alibaba. And, right. and you know, I, I heard that before once. I, someone someone said that, and they're like, oh, you shouldn't short because it's, it's not patriotic. I'm like, well, capitalism is American, and that's patriotic because yeah. it's American, isn't it? So can't we just short? <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? You can look at it both ways, really. But I, I guess, you know, there's an excuse for everything, and... I look at it this way, I'm a trader, and where there's an opportunity, I, I want to take that opportunity. Absolutely. You know? uh, there's so a nice comment that comes in here. I would just say this is focusing on simple is key, and that's you know where, where I've come from for many, many years. It wasn't always there. I was into all the complex stuff, but now it's come down to focus on simple. And I know, you know, my my uh, partners at Stockability, they feel the, exactly the same way. And that's one of the big reasons why I joined them is because they are focused on simplicity, on strategies that work. And, uh, and the other thing, too, just along that same point is, I guess you could call it why traders fail or, you know, we could probably do another show on that one, actually, really. But why, top 10 reasons why traders fail. But one of the reasons is oftentimes education is so expensive. Yeah. You know, and, and and I don't just mean taking a class expensive. It could be just trading is expensive because you're trying to learn and figure stuff out. I mean, heck, I uh, I lost 42 grand on one single trade once. Mm. That was an expense, you yep. know. And so I sure help you learn from it. <laughs> right, yeah. And so uh, you know, the other part is okay. Number one, keep your strategy simple so that you know you as a trader understand, but keep it affordable too. And uh, I'm going to do a little 30 second pitch here because this I really do believe this is important is that trading education should not be burdensome. It really should not be. It should be affordable because everyone should be able to, to do this if they want, you know, within a, a, you know, some kind of reasonable expense because, you know, it's going to cost something, but it shouldn't be a burden. And so what we have done is we have got our pricing down so low that it's less than 150 bucks a month for someone that wants to choose that route. And we're doing, uh, like many other people, a Cyber Monday deal coming <laughs> up. And uh, we're doing some webinars next week. You can get information on stockability.com for that. And uh, I would just say this is if anyone out there is struggling in their trading, focus on keeping it simple. Simplify your trading. And we can certainly help with that. 
and uh, education should not be burdensome, no doubt about that. And I think a lot of people would agree with that part of it, and myself Absolutely. included, because I've, I've been down that path, and it's it's rough. You know, it's a it's a difficult hole that you dig to come out of. And that forty two grand, that was a big hit. In my account. that was about ninety percent of my account at that time, and it took me quite some time to dig myself back out of that one, Merlin. So yeah, and it's not even uh, just that was rough. There's the monetary dig, but I think more damaging is a psychological dig, like I just getting back that. from the psychological. I I yeah. share with my viewers uh, some of my loss yesterday. My worst ever was a hundred thousand. So. Um, you got me beat. <laughs> I'm not trying to one up you, man. I don't want to one up you. <laughs> you win, yay! I'll no, I'm a loser. <laughs> but yeah, trying to get back from those is is somewhat tough. But you know, again, it goes I, back. I want to hear that story. Let's do that next time. We'll come back on. Oh, I, no, I, just I watch really yesterday's. Want to hear that story. I just watched yesterday's show. It's on there. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, I don't want to relive that one again. <laughs> Trust me. Every time I walk by Best Buy, I just curse at them. Like, oh, yesterday. Best Buy, huh? Oh, right. Best Buy is my villain. Um, all right. Well, hey, thank you so much. Again, I thank have the you, website Merlin. up here for those that want. Stockability.com. You can check that out. Click says register for a free webinar, and I'm sure they've got some specials, as everyone will be doing for yep. the holidays. So, uh, again, Cyber Ryan, Monday. Cyber Monday. Well, Ryan, Cyber thanks Monday. so much. I appreciate it. Uh, good luck in You're class welcome. today, and I'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks, Merlin. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Right, thank you. Guys, that was uh, Ryan Watkins. You guys know him from all sorts of different places. He's over at Stockability now and uh, teaching there. So, hopefully, you guys enjoy that one. All right, Jeffrey's on the stock ability as well. Cool, good. You know, the, the tough part is there's so many great teachers out there, and I think you know, for me, it's it's about finding what fits best for you. And you know, I I, I have my favorites. I have my favorite schools. I have my favorite instructors. Of course, I have people that I can't stand, and there's schools that I can't stand. But uh, I usually I don't really mess with the schools so much, except for the one school that you guys all know so well, and the people that work there. But other than that, uh, I'm fine. All right, so uh, again, that was Stockability with Ryan Watkins, going over a little bit of price action. Now, um, there were a couple different things that I wanted to uh, piggyback on, there, but I want to make sure I get Ryan off, because he, he had a uh, prior engagement. When he was talking about indicators, I think it's important to understand that I think if you talk to anybody from OTA, you talk to anybody from Stockability, from Traders Army, they're not going to badmouth indicators and saying that they're absolute garbage. I think that quite often they're misused. And if we use the, the price basis, and I think that's what he was showing you today on the QQQ chart and the Texas Instruments, is saying if you get um, price identified through support or resistance, supply and demand, accumulation, distribution, whatever zone that is that you're comfortable identifying, and then that lines up with something like a, a MACD or a Bollinger Bands or FIBS, whatever, then you can start to use that as a potential odds enhancer. The challenge is, for me, in my experience, is quite often people will use these indicators as the, the, the determinant to make the trade, and then they constantly are changing the parameters and variables. So what happens is you don't get that sort of uh, replicatable success or failure. It's different every time. So you might tweak the numbers and all of a sudden have great success, and then you tweak a little bit more and all of a sudden you're losing. And then you go back to what you were doing and it's not working. So it's about finding a pattern and sticking with it for a while. One day's worth of bad trading doesn't mean your strategy doesn't work. It just means that day didn't work. Um, you know, it's about collecting data sets for all of us. It's about data sets of our trading, time of day, assets that we trade, you know, styles, all of that kind of gets boiled down through analysis and we have to let enough trades come into a study so we can make an assessment of what, about what we're doing. Uh, let's see, I don't get to two questions here which are basically on the same thing. So here is our full screen. You guys should have seen the other image I created today for the Ryan Watkins uh, reading price action show. This is the, the more adult one. I had a really funny one with a bunch of kids reading books and they're all saying Ryan Watkins, but I thought, nah, we'll give him the benefit of that. He's a big boy. So here's the question that came in, or comment actually. And Tom, thank you so much for all the feedback. You always send me some great pieces. Uh, if I don't include them in the show, I do appreciate them. I appreciate all your feedback, feedback actually from all of you guys. The emails and stuff I got was great. Uh, by the way, you guys should have two documents I sent out last night. Um, that I found to be very beneficial for me anyway with regards to the cryptocurrency thing. You guys have been asking about it. I went through probably about 15, 18 different documents that I read when I went to Thailand back in 2016. And that was my reading material for the trip. Most of that stuff is so techy and over the top, it, it just would probably bore you to death. I gave two documents last night. One's the uh, white paper from Satoshi Nakamoto that explains the whole Bitcoin process, which I think once you understand it and read the white paper, it is a brilliant, it's a work of art. Like seriously, that white paper should at some point go into the Louvre in Paris. Um, it is that much of a historical piece of artwork. And the second one was a book by, I think his name is Gustav von Eck or something like that. Ivzi, thank you so much for the contribution, my friend. Appreciate that, that's great. 
Um, if I've got a question, it's just let me know. Um, the second one was a book by Gustav von Eck, which was just called uh, An Idiot's Guide to Bitcoin, which starts off with two chapters about money. What is money? How it works, which for some people, you're going to find it very boring. I think he does a fantastic job of talking about the history and the importance and the progress of money. If you want, don't, you can just jump to chapter three, which starts with Bitcoin, but it does a really good job. It's a bit outdated now, but still the concept of how Bitcoin functions, the math behind it, what it's used for, how it's used is brilliant. So if you didn't get those from me, you can email me at tradeandrona gmail.com and I will um, send those out to you. It's a 115 or 105 page book, but it's a quick, very easy read, which is why I sent it on to everybody. Okay, questions. Um, as you guys all know, last night, Tesla being announced that it's being added to the S&P 500. I'll tell you about that significance here in a second. But Tom says, Tesla has just made the S&P 500, but is facing a tsunami of competition from established and startup manufacturers. GM has grabbed attention with the GMC Hummer EV and a big technical hiring spree. At the moment, the charts make me want to short Tesla and go long GM. What do you see in the charts? And the second one was from Adam. He says, thoughts on Tesla news? Buy Tesla. I had to throw that one in there because I've got one guy saying it'll go long Tesla, and one saying go short. The beauty of financial markets. And I guess we would we could all say that at some point, both of them will be right. There will be some ups, there will be some downs. But if you look at the chart of Tesla right now on a daily, it's not looking pleasant. Today was brilliant. Uh, a couple of people in my trading world were talking about Tesla this morning on the open. Uh, as that announcement came out, it gaps up into an area of supply. This was a gorgeous short. Gorgeous short. Buy the rumors, sell the news. So let me just put on, uh, I'll go right to where I would be looking at it, which is the close up there, right about there. And I think you guys all see that. I'm looking at the high of the, or the, the high excuse me, the closing price of the candle on the 14th of October. So we're just going back a month. Now, if I switch this over to, let's say a 204, let's go a 60 minute chart. Just so I can see the trading today. You guys can see that not only did it gap up on its big announcement, all right, it went from uh, 408 to a high of 462, but that line, uh, it, it just tiptoed across it. It just tiptoed across this line up here at the top, which is at 461, and it ran up to 462. So had you been trading that and looking at um, that zone from back in October, you might have had a limit short out there in Tesla, and this was a beauty. I mean, it fell abruptly in the next two hours, and I, I kind of aligned myself with what Tom was saying here. I think you have a ton of competition. Um, look, another one that came out in the market, which is totally mislabeled, here is FSR Fisker. Okay, Fisker has been around a while. Fisker, Fisker started with Tesla back in the day, getting government subsidies. They just didn't make it. It is a far, I'm going to get on camera for this, a far more sexy electric car than the Tesla Model S. If you guys look, at, look up the Fisker Karma, that is a gorgeous, sexy looking machine, all electric. So they're all of a sudden having a big resurgence because what I think is happening is international companies, uh, Fisker is now Chinese, they bought in. Um, to, I think they bought all of Fisker. They're trying to get on the action too, and Fisker's been established. So yes, I definitely agree. You've got Rivian, you've got uh, um, Nikola, you've got GM now. GM's making a big push. That commercial they did for the Hummer, I'm not a fan of the Hummer, but that vehicle itself looked pretty freaking cool. I mean, this is like every little kid wants one of those when they're in their, t in their sandbox playing with their toys. Like, give me the GMC Hummer all electric. That thing was amazing. So I think Tesla has a lot of headwinds. Uh, they'll start to increase even more as companies like NIO and dozens of other startups from China are trying to push into the US markets. Uh, I think Tesla, it's, it's ironic that the S&P 500 added Tesla after this type of run. Here's, oh sorry, this is, um, this is uh, Fisker. Let me go to TSLA. Um, you know, if you just look at what it did in 2019, Tesla, had a low of $39 and we've just breached 500. Okay, now of course that's split adjusted, but either way, you're looking at something that's just had a ballistic move. If you were smart, why didn't you add it to the S&P back in April of 2019 or June or July or August, right? And had the writing on the wall. Now it seems like it's a little late and I think there's a lot more competition coming into the space. So I'm in agreement with Tom. I think that uh, this is a, a shorting opportunity. And what well, Big Eb says, always nervous trading Tesla short, because, but I agree. 
I think the thing you have to do is just be extremely careful with this. Whatever you're doing, cut your share size in half just because of risk exposure. As you guys can see on this chart, you know this is one of those securities that can jump 100 points, snap of the fingers because of some tweet that Elon Musk puts out. Would not surprise me at all to see Elon Musk say something like, uh, you know, our company's overvalued again, right? I mean, he said that before. He said our company's overvalued and it, and it tanked and then he bought in a bunch and the thing rocked to the upside. It would not surprise me to see that happen yet again. Right now, I think this goes back to what Ryan Watkins was talking about. Um, actually, she and I see, yeah, ascending triangle. For some reason, I read descending. Yes, I agree with you. You know, we could draw it from multiple places, but I think you guys get the general idea and maybe it looks better if you put it right here. You have this ascending triangle, which is, you know, the lows are getting higher. That's a sign of strength on Tesla. Today's news was purely news driven. That's all the that change with Tesla today, guys. The only thing that changed in Tesla is that in uh, almost a month, actually over a month, December 21st, it will be added into an index. They didn't come out with a new car. They didn't get new approval. Then nothing happened. Literally nothing happened with their company today except they were just added to a market index and all of a sudden you have a, an 8% gain on this thing adding about $15 billion to Elon Musk's net worth. Pretty phenomenal. Um, as, as Ryan was talking about, you know, this was the perfect opportunity to short for anybody who's a supply and demand trader. It was beautiful. My guess is you'll probably drift back down, close this gap, and then see where we go from there. Um, it, you know, normally when something has this announcement, it does have a rally going into it because you have to think that any fund, any fund that tracks the S&P 500, so SPY, that basket of securities that makes up that ETF, exchange traded fund, now needs to dump something and buy Tesla. So, you know, long term, I think that you have problems for Tesla. In the short term, I think you're going to close that gap and probably bounce back up, potentially make a new high by December 21st, simply because a lot of tracking indexes are going to have to buy into Tesla. And then it begs the question, is there a potential move by the Dow down the road for Tesla? Who knows? Um, Yes, and, and it's not necessarily that they have to load up, Tom, but they have to buy a proportional amount of shares to fit the balancing of the portfolio of the S&P 500. So they're going to go from no shares of Tesla to having to buy thousands and millions of shares. So yeah, it, it should have a nice pop for Tesla stock, which is why I think you saw it today. Um, the other thing that we don't know yet is who is going to be removed from the S&P 500. So while this is glorious for somebody like Tesla, right now <clears throat> they're still mulling over who will be the one that gets the boot in all of this. So yeah, I beautiful trade today for those that made that one. Awesome, congrats. Um, I, I didn't make it myself, unfortunately. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, let me go to uh, what was happening. I had some, um, there's that. And let's go, I wanna show you just two things that happened today. First off, here's your earnings calendar. Remember, retail, retail, retail is what it's all about this week. You can see that uh, Neo reported earnings after hour, or sorry, uh, after market close today, and they just barely beat. I didn't check out the price of Neo, but I have sold some puts on Neo. I'm waiting for uh, this week to expire, worthless. You also have Kohl's reporting earnings. They just, I would say, blew it out of the water. <laughs> Kohl's, of all things, Kohl's. You know, this I guess when you can go back and go shopping, um, we'll see if this lasts because California is going to go into another lockdown here soon, I believe starting tomorrow. Uh, they were expected to lose 43 cents per share. They made a penny. Home Depot also beat earnings. Walmart also looking great with regards to earnings. That was today. Your economic announcement, our economic calendar for today, uh, changes a little bit here. I did see some numbers looking good, some numbers looking bad. The one that really um, I did not like was the retail sales number. That was a, a surprise. I actually thought that we would see retail sales numbers higher than expectations. And, and keep in mind, for those who are listening to the podcast right now, I know you can't see this table, the previous month's reading was a gain of 1.6% in retail sales, and they expected it to drop to uh, 0.5, so 1.1% slide. Well, it actually came out at 0.3. Now, it's still positive, uh, meaning it's above zero, so it's, it's some retail sales gain, but nowhere near expectations. That's ugly. Now, uh, as I was mentioning, we can rip that apart, right? We can pull apart that report. And if you go to the the reporting agency, I forgot who does the retail sales numbers, but uh, you can pull up the actual spreadsheet of what was losing. And it was furniture stores, uh, department stores, and restaurants were the biggest losers there. So we, as we see rollouts of earnings, be careful. 
because you're thinking clothing stores. Kohl's should have gotten killed, right? Well, they had blowout earnings, and here's the chart of KSS today. Let me bring up KSS. Um, there's your chart of KSS. This is on the daily. Um, so, you know, even though you looked at the retail sales numbers and you saw that uh, clothing stores were some of the most hammered out there, well, they've been beaten up and they were open. So, uh, you know, it's hard to trade off that announcement. It's just kind of discouraging going forward to look at a retail sales numbers of 0.3% for the month of October. Um, hopefully November and December will be good and we can keep this market rolling. But uh, on Kohl's, you also do have it coming right into an overhead supply level for anybody who might be checking that one out for tomorrow. All right, now let me go to your uh, tomorrow's economic announcements and earnings. Big day tomorrow. The one I'm really excited to watch is going to be NVIDIA. They report after market close tomorrow. NVIDIA will be your, uh, let me see, where I got to get my graphic out here. I had all these graphics. It will be your popcorn trade of the day. It's going to look like that. Boom. Lots of price action tomorrow for NVIDIA after market close. What the popcorn trade of the day means is just grab yourself a bowl of Orville Redenbacher popcorn, put your feet on your desk, change your chart to a one minute time frame, and just watch the mayhem that happens in after hour session. That's your popcorn trade of the day. All right, back to our charts here. You've got Target, Lowe's, TJ Maxx, and L Brands, all of which are major retailers, three of which come out before market open. Target, Lowe's, and TJ Maxx. Uh, L Brands comes out after market close. Uh, and for your economic calendar for tomorrow, yeah, there is some exciting stuff on here. I guess we have building uh, permits and housing starts tomorrow, crude oil inventories as well. And then for the euro, you're looking at consumer price index numbers. If you're trading the Aussie dollar, which we've been talking a lot about with our Forex traders, you have an unemployment number coming out tomorrow as well. All right, um, that will do it. Oh, let me see real quick. I, I, I'm, I, can't, I cannot let you guys win with an hour show. I just can't do it. Uh, Walgreens boots got hammered as Amazon announced their pharmacy deal. Did you short that? No, I did not. Uh, did not see, even see that one today. Unfortunately, I was busy with other stuff. I was too busy focusing on that Tesla trade. Um, all right, cool. Well, hope you guys enjoyed that one with uh, Ryan Watkins. Tomorrow, I'm going to have Corey Lane of Traders Army on the program. We'll talk about options and some other perspectives he may have on the markets. Uh, again, if you guys like today's show, do me a favor, give me a thumbs up. You can always leave comments and questions down below the video on the YouTube page. That always helps. Uh, you can also always email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Of course, I know some of you want the cryptocurrency stuff. Just request that, and I'll send you those two documents there. Uh, if you like Ryan Watkins, you can go check him out at stockability.com. And again, thank you guys for uh, staying with us and enjoying the show today. That will do it for me, everybody. Have a fantastic day. I will see you tomorrow with Corey Lane talking options. Take care.